So we are incredibly lucky. Um, Ellen Stofan, who has an amazingly busy schedule and is almost even never in our building because she's all over the world spreading the NASA word, uh, is here to talk to us today. So please welcome our chief scientist, Dr. Ellen Stofan. Thanks for having me come by this morning. Um, I don't really have any prepared remarks. Um, I just want to say I'm a huge fan uh, of this program because when we go out and start talking, and I go out to the public a lot and talk about what NASA is doing and what our priorities are, um, and the message that we have that resonates with the public, with our stakeholders um, around the world is this idea that we are trying to answer this question of are we alone? And to make sure that we can always stick to science-based answers, uh, that we have innovative ways to look at how to address this question, um, the broad questions across astrobiology, uh, I think is really critical. And so Mary keeps me updated um, on the research that you're doing, and it's really critical. And obviously, I always show this chart when I talk about, give an overview of science at NASA. And you know, frankly, when you show how we're organized, it's pretty stovepiped. Uh, the way the academy works is, is in these stovepipes. And so the work that you guys are doing by nature cuts across those disciplines. It cuts across everything that we do at NASA. Uh, and because of that, I think you know, that's where the really exciting science is going to come from uh, over the next 10, 20 years. Um, so I really encourage you, obviously, to keep doing what you're doing. Uh, and really stay focused on how you can keep pushing these bounds of the disciplines to move us forward as we increasingly start to get better and better data. What instrumentation do we need? What are the missions we need in the future? Because the way we're set up is not necessarily to really grab hold of and move forward um, in the areas that you guys are working in. So I think this is an incredibly great program. Um, I'm excited by what you guys are doing. Um, the other thing, and this is a totally off-topic issue, um, but this year we've started collecting demographic data on our proposers in order to assess whether we have um, implicit bias in our, in our selections, but also, frankly, to always be assessing uh, what does the community actually look like, the community of proposers, um, how does that reflect the community overall. And so it's voluntary through NSPIRES, it's a voluntary collection of demographic data. But I really urge people to fill the form out because until we have, we are a scientific community, we like data, um, and in, until we actually have real data, it's very hard to assess how we're doing as a community. So that's my off-topic side message. Um, so the primary things that we do through the office, you probably are wondering what the heck does the chief scientist do. The primary things that I do through my office is look across all the, the areas of science at NASA, from heliophysics to earth science, planetary science, astrophysics, and the science that we do every day on the International Space Station, getting ready to send humans to Mars. Um, and so I've been especially involved in this whole uh, effort on what are we going to do in the 2020s and 2030s in terms of getting people actually eventually down onto the surface of Mars, um, and looking also at the broad strategies Going, going forward in science at NASA. So I'm happy to take any questions um, across the board, policy issues, science issues, whatever. Questions? This is your chance. Yeah. <laughs> David Grinspoon, I'm going to put you on the spot. Ask me a question. How's that Venus research going? <laughs> Dave and I were working on a paper together that's way not done, so. Well, this, this is kind of <laughs> random, I guess, but since you put me on the spot, I'll, yeah. I'll put you on the spot. Um, Jim Green gave a talk this morning that was really great um, about ocean worlds, and one of the things he um, did was he started off by talking about Mars, and in, uh, I thought very um, skillfully showed that Mars fits within the ocean worlds theme because he talked about um, the, all this uh, exciting new evidence for oceans and tsunamis and um, how uh, the uh, evidence of an eighth ancient ocean is very important, obviously, for what we're doing, astrobiology and all that. And so um, if there was an opportunity for, for uh, questions after Jim's talk, which there wasn't, I would have said, that was wonderful. And I assume that that means that Venus is also part of ocean worlds. So is it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
any any word, but if we go by that definition, um, then any world that once had an ocean, which of course many of us suspect that Venus did early in its history. So to me, again, it fits very much, especially if we're trying to really push on this whole issue of where to look for life in solar systems beyond our solar system. Um, I think to divide it up into the habitable zone, and obviously that's now a really loose concept because you could say planets move in and out of that zone. And we suspect that Venus was in it and moved out of it. Mars was in it and moved out of it. Um, and then how do we deal with that in terms of these icy worlds of the outer solar system? That was obviously the original intent of the ocean worlds uh, program. But I think Jim is being useful in the sense of really tying it back to this question of water. And then, of course, many of you in this room know that I have a bias that should we just be looking at water in the case of uh, my favorite body in the solar system, Titan. Hey, Casey. Jim said something very interesting. Very Boy, interesting it's like question. Jim Green didn't answer questions, so you get all his questions. <laughs> <laughs> something that maybe should have been obvious is really that we have been a lot of arguments now that, that uh, Mars was wet early on and warm, but where it is with respect to the sun, especially for a young sun that was supposedly less luminous, he pointed out it had to have a very strong greenhouse. And that's a very interesting point. And with relation to Venus, it means the greenhouses can come and go. Right. And maybe Venus, we all think. So it's very interesting to think. I haven't heard much speculation about what Venus was like very early on. Yeah, well, there was tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Right. Well, I mean, David could go on about this forever. Uh, no, not forever. Um, I could. Man, oh, okay, okay, he could. Uh, you, you know, but obviously the challenge for Venus is we really need the geochemical information from the surface because there's this huge debate over whether there are rocks like granites on the surface. You know, there's been speculation that there is. But if we could get at the geochemistry um, and the mineralogy of some of the rocks on Venus, that would help us address this question of was water ever really stable on the surface um, the way some models suggest that it was. Um, but I think there's good reason to believe that at, at one point Venus was just as habitable as Earth. But that's controversial. We need more data. And, and obviously there are two discovery proposals um, in that would move us a little further towards understanding Venus. Yeah. Venus, though those of you who are at the sequestration is important. Yeah, yeah. No, it's hugely important. And for those of you, though, for those of you who did, weren't at the first comparative climatology conference, it was a fascinating article, but uh, argument between the Venus scientists and the um, and the Earth climate scientists about not the carbonates, but if we took all the tar sands and all the coal and all the oil and we put all that CO2 in the atmosphere, would we get to a runaway situation? Um, the way we have here on the Earth, and they decided, no, it would actually just be shy of that. The Earth, oceans wouldn't completely boil off. The Earth would long before become uninhabitable, but you couldn't call it a runaway, and they were having this huge argument, runaway, not runaway, and I'm like, can we go back to the part where the Earth becomes uninhabitable? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so it was, a, it was a depressing discussion. Either way, it's not a good idea. Right, it's not, it's not a good experiment. The one we're running, not a good experiment. So, although a card-carrying member of the Venus Mafia, I'm well, not exactly. actually going to talk about Venus. <laughs> um, we, we've heard from, actually from several people today about this issue of stovepipes and breaking stovepipes. And these stovepipes don't come about because there's some evil genius forcing this upon us. Are there you sure? Some, <laughs> That's a joke. There That's are some joke. very powerful forces that, that tend us into that sort of organization. And we are, with this program, attempting to fight those forces, but I'm I'm thinking that's kind of a band-aid approach. How do we attack that tendency at more of a root level to try to generate more interdisciplinary science, kind of pre-stovepipe, maybe with our next generation of upcoming scientists? Well, I, I think that's a, a really good question. And I, I think, um, you know, because we're just talking about climate, which obviously plays into habitability, all, all these issues, habitability, climate, none of those belong in a single discipline. And of course, a lot of what we do goes back to the structure of the decadals. On the other hand, you could argue the structure of the decadals reflects what we do. Um, and, and I got asked this question at a conference about a couple months ago about whether or not the decadals were still useful because of the increasingly interdisciplinary nature of what we were doing with the search for life. Um, and, and with the earth and climate, you could say there's just lots of issues. On the other hand, there's still huge value in the science that gets done within the stovepipes. I don't want to denigrate that. 
so to me, it is really thinking about when we approach the the academy, because I do think it's 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 the proper role to me of the academy and its committees to really be stepping back and taking this big picture view and saying where are we going with the science and what's the right philosophy. Um, at NASA, we like to implement what the decadal what the decadals ask us to. So I'd really like to see even in the midterms, because obviously we're um, astrophysics, we're the closest to heliophysics. I think we're the furthest from a new decadal and planetary work coming up on the midterm before too long. And I'd love to see them starting to really push on this issue because, uh, you know, you could argue the ags. Are the ags, is that structure still useful as we go forward into a world where science is becoming increasingly interdisciplinary or not? You know, so I think those are the big questions that to me, I hate to pass the buck, but I'd love to see the academy go after those. And it's a way also to make sure the whole scientific community is engaged, not just those of us at NASA headquarters sitting in a smoke-filled room, except of course we don't smoke. Hi, Ellen. Um, you were on a panel at one of the congressional hearings, and I think it was Lamar Smith who asked uh, the panel, put you guys on the spot, and asked you, where do you think we're going to find evidence of life first? And your answer was on Mars, and I'm just wondering what, if you could share more details about that. Yeah, you know, I, I guess I am incredibly optimistic about Mars, and it's not that I'm not optimistic about other places also, it's just I think we have the tools in hand to actually attack the question at Mars in the near term um, because of the fact that we have this constant steady stream of, of missions going to Mars. Um, between Curiosity, you know, which has obviously found some early, you know, Melissa's standing there. We sense curiosity. No, no, I was just laughing because I was about to start talking about intriguing evidence of organic molecules from, from um, Sam um, to the fact that we've got the 2020 rover going with a number of experience uh, experiments. You've got to, uh, the ExoMars rover, which will now go in 2020. You know, we have all these spacecraft going and looking for signs. Um, I do have a bias that I think we're going to find increasing indications that Mars did have life in the past, but I honestly do think it'll take humans cracking open a whole lot of rocks before we ever get the scientific community to agree on the fact that, yes, there was definitely. I, I think the problem with, with extrasolar planets is I think it's just going to take us a while to have the technology. Again, I think we're going to find really indica interesting indications the more atmospheric data we start getting we're going to be finding things that are really intriguing. Are they going to move beyond indications to where everybody in the science community says, yes, that's not just a potentially habitable planet. It's We see something there that we all agree is, is indicative of life. Europa and Enceladus, I, I'm, I'm probably also optimistic there's potentially life there. I just think it's going to be really hard to pin it down. With Enceladus, at least it's spitting its ocean out at you. You can sample. If Europa is not you know, if it doesn't have plumes, I think it's just going to take us a while. It's not that we can't do it, it's just going to take us a bit longer. So, <clears throat> your last comment on Mars actually segues perfectly into my question. Um, you mentioned earlier just about being really involved in, in thinking um, of the next steps for human exploration and, and how that involves Mars. And one question I had was how, how much do you think that the goal of searching for evidence of life going to play a role in our human exploration of Mars because I think many of us know that there's a, that could in, impose a lot of requirements and restrictions, etc. if we want to be really careful and thorough about finding kind of that needle in the haystack and that definitive marker and, and I'm just curious um, on your feel of how much that possible science goal might feed into our, our exploration goals. You know, some people say that destin. You know, pe people say we'll say, oh, destinations don't matter. You know, we just need to move humans out beyond the Earth, and it doesn't matter where we go. And as a scientist, I just don't agree with that. To me, I want to say, where is the human actually going to be hugely additive? Where is it really going to move the science forward? And obviously, you know, I'm a field geologist, so I'm going to tell you that it, we need field geologists on planetary surfaces because I really do have this bias. You know, I've. I've worked all day wandering around the Morrison Formation for hours and never seen a fossil. Okay, if I had the bright chemical instruments, I could have told that, you know, told you that that was an inhabited time. But you know, fossils aren't easy to find. Indications of life aren't hard to are hard to find. And I really do think it's going to take humans. Um, and I think it's a compelling argument. And frankly, I do think it's one that resonates 
um, with our stakeholders and with the public, some of them. Some of them, it doesn't resonate at all. They're like, who cares? You know, why do we need to do that? And somebody said, you know, there's three reasons why you explore. One of them is knowledge. And that, to me, is what puts Mars so much at the front, the fact that this knowledge goal is there. Um, the other one is greed, um, or you can rephrase that as economic benefit. That's a better way to put it. Um, <laughs> And you can say, you know, when you invest in your economy, when you try to do hard things, you're spending that money here on Earth, we're not launching it into space, we're actually, you know, creating jobs in the economy. And that does resonate with some people, but that's where destinations maybe don't matter so much, except again, I think going to Mars is hard. So that's really making you do that push forward. And, and the third reason, which we don't so much have right now, um, is some kind of like national prestige, power issue, which, you know, that was obviously the Cold War in terms of going to the moon. But I would argue we have an interesting situation right now where you've had at least two commercial companies come forward and say, either we're going to go, we have a we have a plan for NASA to get to Mars, um, they just have to buy it from us, or I'm going to go to Mars on my own, maybe NASA will come, maybe they won't. And so, so maybe we don't have that national competition issue we had when we went to the moon. <laughs> But we have these really interesting commercial issue where you have people like Elon Musk who says he's going to Mars one way or the other. Um, and so we're in this really unusual time period where the motivators moving us forward are interesting. And I think this is completely feasible. NASA, we can get humans to the Mars vicinity by the early 2030s. Getting onto the surface is harder, but we can at least get them in the vicinity by the early 2030s. And then obviously, as you sort of alluded to with the issue of going into special regions, you know, could you do orbital manipulations of rovers going into special regions where we wouldn't want to send humans anyway to at least start this process? It's a whole interesting area. It's complex trades when you're trying to work in architecture that's affordable, which is what we're trying to do. Uh, hi, I'm Mark Hoffman, and I uh, write an online column for Nexus and I've also written a book about astrobiology. Uh, and I, I was doing a reporting, you know, maybe six, seven years ago. And if I was to ask, we would have gotten the same kind of answer that we're getting now in terms of it, both Dr. Grunsfeld and then now you were saying that it's kind of the organizing principle of NASA. Uh, could you maybe elaborate a bit on that in terms of uh, a little bit of how it came to be and then also just to you know, kind of uh, put a stake in the ground, is that indeed, from your view, the organizing principle of NASA? Uh, in the agency? Um, yeah, I think it's an interesting question because if you go back um, to Viking, which is what actually helped to motivate me to go to become a planetary geologist, and, and you look at the fact that that was an organizing concept back then, you know, it was what drove the exper some of the experiments on the Viking lander in terms of saying, you know, we do think that Mars is a potentially habitable environment. Let's go address it. So to me, it's all it's always been there. Um, but then to me, if I look through the past 20 years from ALH 84001, um, with getting the public interest, that's what then more or less got us the Mars program with this idea of following the water looking for evidence of life on Mars. And so t it's been a long, steady ramp up. Um, in its importance, and I think the formation of the Mars program, I don't know what year that was, um, uh, about 15, 20 years ago, um, and then the continuing lines of evidence. And then to me, you had this sudden explosion over the last 20 years with extrasolar planets and this, you know, the fact that we could all of a sudden start discovering exoplanets. And then to me, Kepler has just changed the dialogue um, in terms of really allowing us to talk about the sheer numbers of planets we found, fact that we're finding them in habitable zones, following up with tests, following up with James Webb and W first. And so all of a sudden you're able to show, we're now able to keep gathering this data in a systematic way that's allowing us to really look at the possibilities for life in an entirely different way. And then of course now map on the, the life in extreme environments program that's gone on, on over the 30 years. And I think it's just all come together to make people realize you know, this is this is an, a unifying theme. Then I think when people looked at moving humans beyond Earth, and you start talking about, well, why are we sending humans to Mars? 
um, it all starts fitting together. Um, and I will say, I don't, I don't want to put that aside from understanding this planet, the 19 missions, Earth science missions that we have that are doing such critical work in, in trying to understand what's happening with our rapidly changing climate and what's moving into the future. So I don't want to say the search for life encompasses all of what NASA does, but I think it does bring together all the scientific disciplines in a way that, frankly, our stakeholders understand, the public understands, the public resonates with, and it allows us to talk about our science in this integrative way. It doesn't leave off science that doesn't, doesn't fit into that theme, but I think it's, it's a way that we can talk to the public that, that resonates with them. And by the public, I do include Congress and the White House. Sean Dunbo, Goldman, Nancy Goddard. Um, so Ellen, my question is, and first of all, thank you for the support for this kind of activity. It means a lot to us. Um, and the reason we brought all these folks here to spend their time is to get to know each other today, but then to start working on what we want to nucleate uh, in terms of projects for the next year to really start to grow this community. And so I guess my question for you is, is from your perspective, um, I, I loved your comments, by the way, about the, the survey, right? Like we, first of all, it's important that we're doing that, but secondly, it's great to have data. So from your perspective, what, what's the data, what's the evidence that this is working uh, so that we can sort of start to focus on those things that, that, that are best from your perspective? You know, every time I go out and talk to any of the stakeholders or our public, they really want to know how are we doing this? You know, why are we doing it and, and how are we doing it? Um, and so to me, the more you guys again can be pulling on the threads and, and showing that this is research based, um, that you're able to identify where are the weak areas in the data, where are we getting data that is, you know, that we need, but that we already have, but again, what is it that we need? What are the key measurements we need going forward? What's the key instrumentation that we need going forward? How do we scope the problem in ways that that are attackable? And so I think the more you can do that as a community, and then the more you can go out and talk about it, the better off we're going to be. Because what you're doing, again, is so engaging. Um, and so the more you can be communicating about it, as a community, the better off you're, you're going to be. Because people are just dying to hear about this. They really are. Um, and the more we can keep it as a community of here's something, this isn't science, science fiction. You know, We're using research-based solutions to make predictions. And, and how do we move that forward? And how do we do that with the best data possible? So I think what you're doing is really critical. You just need to keep doing it. Well, I'm going to repeat in NASA Government Space Science Center. Uh, the sending humans uh, to Mars is really expensive business. And uh, how successful are we in engaging European Space Agency, JAXA, um, in that process? Um, well, I have spent a lot of the last two months traveling around the world talking to our partner agencies. I just got back from Canada a few year, uh, weeks ago. I was in Germany um, and France. I'm about to go to Italy and back to France. So we're actively engaged with our partners. Um, our partners, if you think we have budget pressures here in the United States, think about our partner nations who are dealing with a huge immigrant crisis, um, the scale of, of which we are not dealing with here in the US. And they are dealing with huge security concerns um, after France, after Belgium. Um, and so the pressures on their budget are huge. And yet, we still hear a lot of wanting for positive engagement. Realize also that for most of our partner agencies, the ISS really remains their focus. Um, the uh, ESA is the only partner who has not yet extended the ISS to 2024. Uh, all the other partners have extended to 2024. We feel that that extension is our first priority on this sending humans beyond low Earth orbit because there are is real research we have to do before we can feel comfortable sending humans beyond. We have this beautiful PowerPoint chart that shows all the human risks from, you know, bone density loss, which we're dealing with pretty well, the intracranial pressure rise and the visual issues, which we still have work to do on. Life support systems, frankly, is still one of our biggest challenges. Keeping the CO2 levels down on the ISS is still a huge challenge. Keeping the toilet working on the ISS is a huge challenge. So. So we're mostly working with our partner nations right now on how do we get humans ready to go to spend extended periods in microgravity 
with reliable life support systems. And so that's kind of the first step. Um, and they are very interested and they're very engaged. They are very interested in partnering with us beyond that, but they are also in the same position we are as they say, you know, what are we going to commit to? What's our budget? What does it look like? What are the areas that we want to invest in? Technologies, capabilities. And so that discussion between the NASA and its partner agencies is basically taking place right now in terms of what are we going to do robotically at Mars in the 2020s to get ready to send humans? What are we going to be doing at a deep space habitat that we're going to put out in the vicinity of the moon? Do our partners want to get down to the surface of the moon or not? Uh, and where are we going to partner in each of those different areas? And, and that's the kind of discussion that's going on. And they are interested, but right now everybody's focus is on let's keep the ISS stable through at least 2024 because we need it to, to do this critical research on before we move humans further outward. Thank you. Okay. I have a 10.30 meeting, so I have to go. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.